Am kommenden Dienstag werden die US-Bürger einen neuen Präsidenten wählen. Glaubt man den Umfragen, dann liegen die beiden Kontrahenten Kamala Harris und Donald Trump Kopf an Kopf. Alles deutet auf einen extrem knappen Wahlausgang hin. Nach den Erfahrungen von 2020 sind die Befürchtungen groß, sowohl seitens der Demokraten als auch der Republikaner, dass es zu Unregelmäßigkeiten bei der Wahl kommt oder sogar zu gewalttätigen Ausbrüchen. Wie schätzt du die Lage in den USA ein? Rechnest du mit einem fairen und geordneten Wahlausgang? Given the extent to which the 2020 election was marred by allegations um, and in some cases direct evidence to support some of the allegations of campaign irregularities, voter irregularities, election irregularities, um, and the fact that nothing has been done to address the systemic failures of 2020, um, I fully anticipate that there will be similar uh, problems in the upcoming election. Uh, never forget that there was a cabal of, um, of progressive pro-democratic elements that bragged, openly bragged in December of 2020. Uh, they did so in writing in a Time Magazine article of the extra constitutional measures they took to um, sway the election towards Joe Biden. That means measures beyond which would are normally expected in an election, uh, efforts to um, adjust um, the processes in favor of one candidate over the other, in this case, Biden over Trump. We know this happened because they admit it happened. Uh, the mainstream media uh, didn't pick up on the Time Magazine story and uh, the courts um, failed to criminalize uh, this activity, but it happened. And it happened on a scope and scale that makes it impossible for anybody to say Joe Biden won a free and fair election. Um, I'm not saying that he would have lost a free and fair election. I'm saying that the election he won was not a free or fair election. And there is a real possibility that this election in 2024 will not be a free and fair election. Uh, I think the Republicans are seeking to uh, overcome this obstacle uh, by promoting turnout, uh, getting people who um, historically haven't voted in elections to come out. This kind of um, unplanned turnout is what helped propel Trump to victory in 2016. And uh, they're hoping that in this election, uh, millions of Americans who otherwise would not have voted will come out and vote for him. And that the scale of the participation will overcome um, the electoral deficiencies in the system that the Democrats are counting upon to throw the election their way. In either case, this doesn't bode well for American democracy. This isn't how elections are supposed to be won or conducted. And it just further certifies that America, far from being the leader of the free world in terms of its democratic um, you know, credentials, is a third world banana republic when it comes to how we run national elections. It's an embarrassment. Um, in 2020, unfortunately, we did see violence related to this. So the January 6th um, events, um, there was a permanent stain on the on American democracy. And um, again, nothing has been done that uh, would alleviate um, or resolve the underlying issues that led to that violence. So there is real potential uh, for violence uh, if if the um, election is shown to be fraudulent. Um, it, it, and again, we don't need it to be the reality of fraudulence. Perception oftentimes creates its own reality. And if the perception of electoral fraud exists, then the election itself is nullified in the minds of millions of Americans. Um, the only hope is that the that there is a tidal wave in one direction or the other, that the um, the response of the voters is so overwhelmingly in favor of one candidate that it um, it nullifies any notion of um, the outcome being determined by fraud. Um, so we need so much participation that even if there is fraud, it it doesn't matter.
again, that doesn't speak well for American, the viability of the American uh, electoral model, but that's where we're at. I, um, I fully anticipate there to be, um, there to be demonstrations in the street, regardless of who wins. Um, and sadly, these demonstrations may in fact turn violent um, as people express their frustration. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I do believe that there will be a transfer of power from the Biden administration to whomever wins and that whoever wins will eventually um, get the traction necessary to, uh, to govern a uh, deeply divided uh, nation. Wir haben in den vergangenen Wochen häufig über eine Wahl zwischen Atomkrieg und Diplomatie gesprochen. Kurz vor dem Wahltermin hat sich der Republikaner Trump deutlich positioniert. Er versprach, dass er keine US-Soldaten in fremde Kriege führen werde. Noch deutlicher äußerte sich sein designierter Vizepräsident J.D. Vance. Angesprochen darauf, ob er Putin als Feind sehe, antwortete er, wir befinden uns nicht im Krieg mit ihm und ich möchte keinen Krieg mit Wladimir Putins Russland führen. Wie glaubwürdig sind diese Aussagen von Trump und Vance? Würden sie tatsächlich eine Außenpolitik in Richtung Dialog mit Russland und ohne US-Kriege in aller Welt führen? Wie unterscheiden sie sich mit dieser Orientierung von Harris und den Demokraten? Well, I mean, the proof is always in the pudding and one always has to take words that candidates say on the uh, campaign trail with um, a heavy grain of salt. Um, I mean, one just remembers Joe Biden running in 2020, claiming that he was going to uh, modify American uh, nuclear posture, nuclear war posture, away from the policy of preemption that he inherited from Donald Trump to a policy that embraced the uh, sole purpose doctrine. That is, the sole purpose of America's nuclear arsenal is to deter nations from attacking us. Instead, he not only kept Donald Trump's uh, preemptive policy, but he uh, broadened it, making it even more dangerous and elevating the risk of the potential of nuclear conflict. So campaign promises are meaningless, literally meaningless. Um, but I do believe that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance um, recognize the danger of nuclear war. I do believe that they are sincere in their desire to pursue policies that achieve um, stability with Russia. Uh, we may not be friends with Russia. That's a very difficult uh, path to go down given what's going on. I don't even know if Russia wants to be friends with the United States anymore, but definitely Russia doesn't want to be at war with the United States. And I think um, that Trump and Vance are to believe, be believed when they say they are not seeking a war with Russia. How they get there is another question because it will require them to go against the grain of decades of American policy, including the four years of Trump's first administration. Um, and it also depends in large part on who Trump surrounds himself with. Um, if Mike Pompeo is part of his team, if uh, Nikki Haley is part of his team, I cannot foresee uh, a Trump foreign policy that. Um, is built on the premise of normalizing relations with Russia. Instead, we would get more of the same. Um, but if you get a new group of people and people cut from the same cloth to say RFK Jr. or Tulsi Gabbard, both of whom were advising uh, Donald Trump on issues, including the war in Ukraine, <clears throat> then there's a chance. But then you have to deal with Congress. And, um, you know, navigating this through Congress. Um, but I believe that if Trump made preventing nuclear war and made, um, you know, resolving the Ukrainian conflict his top, one of his top foreign policy objectives, that Congress would fall in behind him, especially if he's able to bring about, con you know, uh, Republican majorities in both the Senate and the House. So, I think there's hope with Trump. It's it's difficult to say because he has a mixed track record of uh, of you know when it comes to things of this issue. He's not somebody who is uh, against the use of military force. His assassination of Qasem Soleimani proves this. Um, but he recognizes that the American economic health will be um, damaged badly. So 
well, by any future conflict, especially between the United States and Russia. So I'll, I'll put this on the uh, I am hopeful that he is telling the truth, um, you know, part of my uh, my ledger. Uh, with Kamala Harris, um, all you'll get from her is more of the same. Uh, she has not articulated any sound policy strategies uh, with Russia other than to repeat the same mantra that uh, Joe Biden does about the evil nature of Vladimir Putin um, and how Russia is wrong in invading Ukraine and she will back Ukraine to victory. Um, all of this bodes uh, badly for the prospects of peace. And um, uh, unfortunately, if Kamala Harris were elected president, I believe that the threat of a conflict between Russia and the United States that eventually goes nuclear would uh, remain quite high. Vergangene Woche rückte Harris Trump in die Nähe von Adolf Hitler. Sie unterstellte dem Republikaner ein Faschist und ungeeignet für das Amt des US-Präsidenten zu sein. Jetzt melden sich Auschwitz-Überlebende wie der 94-jährige Jerry Wardsky zu Wort und fordern von Harris eine Entschuldigung. Trump selbst deutete die extreme Rhetorik der Demokratin so, dass sie die Nerven verliere angesichts der Umfragewerte. Trump sagte am Montag klar, ich bin kein Nazi, ich bin das Gegenteil eines Nazis. Wie ordnest du diese Debatte ein? Lässt sich Trump wirklich mit Hitler vergleichen? Was sagt dieser Vergleich aus deiner Sicht über Harris selbst aus? Well, of course, Donald Trump cannot be compared to Adolf Hitler and the political campaign he's running in no way, shape or form uh, replicates anything the Nazi party did in uh, Germany in the 1930s. Uh, it's absurd and extreme to make that comparison. It's very dangerous to make that comparison. Uh, you know, Kamala Harris is just repeating the past practice of the Democratic Party, though, of Joe Biden himself, of Nancy Pelosi, of other senior Democrats who have called Donald Trump Hitler-like uh, over the course of many months, uh, likened him to um, an existential threat to American democracy, saying that if he is elected, America itself will be destroyed. Uh, and it's kind of hate-filled re rhetoric that... Uh, you know, contributes to the psychosis in America of political violence um, that led to the attempted Butler assassination uh, in Pennsylvania, led to somebody to try and take Trump's life on a golf course in Florida and could lead to additional threats against the uh, former president's life between now and um, not only election day, but if he wins between election day and inauguration day where people will seek to, to uh, terminate this threat to American democracy. This is extraordinarily dangerous rhetoric on the part of uh, Kamala Harris, irresponsible in the extreme. It should be condemned by everybody possible. And uh, it does reflect the desperate, uh, you know, state that she finds her campaign to be in at this point in time. Lass uns thematisch nach Europa gehen. Der polnische Präsident Andrzej Duda machte in den vergangenen Tagen von sich reden, weil er sich für den Aufbau eines neuen eisernen Vorhangs aussprach. Dieser soll darauf abzielen, Russland vom EU-Europa zu separieren. Damit einhergeht ein massiver Ausbau der polnischen Grenzanlagen in Richtung russischer Exklave Kaliningrad und Richtung Weißrussland. Duda betonte, es wird einen eisernen Vorhang geben, solange wir auf der freien Seite des Vorhangs sind. Wie siehst du diese Debatte um einen eisernen Vorhang in Europa? Lässt sich so ein Konzept verwirklichen? Und wie würde es sich auf die EU auswirken? It's a joke. Dude is a joke. Poland's a joke. Um, Russia could care less. If Poland wants to build a fortification, build it. Russia doesn't threaten Poland. Russia doesn't intend on threatening Poland. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that all it will do is isolate Poland because the rest of Europe recognizes the absolute necessity of working with Russia going forward. Um, you know, the, the, the reality is Europe will not fall behind Poland. Poland is not a European leader. Um, that's what Poland needs to understand. They are basically, you know, just the slightly larger version of the, of the Baltic poodles whose barks irritate people but accomplish nothing. Uh, Poland has no real power, economic, political, or military. Um, it can't become Uh, a relevant power without the full backing of Europe, and Europe will not back this uh, this this stupidity. Um, this Ukraine conflict will end, will probably end sooner rather than later. And when it does end, Europe will have no choice but to learn how to live with Russia as a neighbor, if not a partner, at least a neighbor that uh, with whom they have 
a non-adversarial relationship with. Poland is posturing in the absolute wrong direction because Poland recognizes that its only hope for future European relevance is to keep NATO alive, to keep the European Union alive. And uh, they're going to attempt to do that by redefining NATO and the European Union as uh, anti-Russian forces. Um, but again, I, you know, Germany is a much bigger nation, a much more powerful nation, a much more relevant nation. And I think you see even within Olaf Scholz's party, the growing recognition that um, uh, the I continued isolation of Germany from Russia will be devastating for German, Germany economically and devastating for Europe uh, politically. And so, you know, France recognizes the need to have good relations with Russia. Italy recognizes this. I just named three nations that are far more relevant uh, individually and collectively than Poland will ever be. So this is just a stupid stunt pay, you know, uh, being played by the the, the Polish leadership. And um, I predict that uh, these fortifications will not be completed because they're far too expensive and the Polish cannot afford to do it on their own. And they will be compelled to do it on their own because nobody will fund this. In Deutschland wächst der Druck auf Bundeskanzler Olaf Scholz, sein Nein zur Lieferung von Taurus-Marschflugkörpern an die Ukraine aufzugeben. Vor allem die CDU und ihr Vorsitzender Friedrich Merz treten dabei besonders als Scharfmacher auf. Merz warf Scholz vor, Angst vor Putin zu haben. Ihm zufolge sei Scholz der Einzige, der einer Taurus-Lieferung an Kiew noch im Weg stehe. Wird Scholz letztlich einknicken und grünes Licht für die Taurus-Lieferung geben? Woher kommt dieser enorme Druck dafür? Hat Washington dabei seine Hände im Spiel? I don't believe that uh, Germany will give in. Um, it would be uh, disastrous for Germany. Germany would pay a price. Um, <coughs> I think the political trend within Germany is away from confrontation with Russia and uh, toward um, peaceful coexistence, if not collaboration, at least peaceful coexistence. Uh, but there are... Um, There is an element within the German political and military elite that has invested a considerable amount of political capital into um, Olaf Scholz's Ukrainian gambit and um, aren't willing to just cut and run. Um, so they're seeking to double down to um, further um, you know, German involvement in the Ukraine conflict. And I think that's the source of this pressure. It's pressure that's... Uh, you know, supported politically by the United States and uh, its allies in Europe and in uh, and, and, and pressure that uh, I believe is also funded uh, directly or indirectly, um, you know, by the the war party, by the those who profit from uh, war. And so I, I think that's what you're seeing. But I, I don't believe that it has a, um, a broad base of support amongst the German people. And ultimately, I believe this effort will fail. Der russische Präsident Wladimir Putin hat am Wochenende erneut eine deutliche Warnung in Richtung NATO geschickt. Russland werde entsprechend reagieren, wenn westliche Langstreckenwaffen gegen russische Ziele eingesetzt werden. Putin betonte, es sei klar, dass die Ukraine diese Waffen nicht alleine bedienen können und daher NATO-Offiziere direkt daran beteiligt seien. Die russischen Streitkräfte erwägen laut Putin derzeit mehrere Optionen, wie sie auf Langstreckenangriffe reagieren würden. Mit welcher russischen Reaktion rechnest du, wenn die Ukraine tatsächlich westliche Raketen auf Russland richtet? Würde Russland tatsächlich Ziele innerhalb der NATO angreifen? I mean, a lot would depend on what targets were struck, uh, what damage was done, etc. I mean, Russia will, of course, respond. That's not a question. The question is, what will the scope and scale of the Russian response be? And that will, in a large part, depend on the urgency for which uh, deterring future strikes of that nature is is seen if these strikes do harm to russia i think the russian response will be um devastating for um for those parties involved uh, for ukraine uh, but i also believe that uh the, the the nations involved will pay a price um, directly or indirectly using russian military technical capabilities Whether this translates into a direct strike on, for instance, uh, United Kingdom soil or uh, American soil or German soil, um, 
only Russia can make that decision, but there will be a price to be paid. It will. And I believe that uh, Russia will strike um, outside of the uh, Ukrainian uh, boundaries. And Russia is prepared to take the escalation as, uh, as far as it needs to go um, to ensure that uh, this kind of activity uh, is not continued by Ukraine and its NATO partners. Lass uns abschließend über die Frage sprechen, ob nordkoreanische Soldaten aktiv am Kampfgeschehen in der Ukraine teilnehmen. NATO-Generalsekretär Makrote erklärte am Montag, dass sich eine große Anzahl nordkoreanischer Soldaten in der russischen Region Kursk aufhalte. Dort würden sie aktiv an Kampfhandlungen gegen die ukrainischen Truppen teilnehmen. Russland und Nordkorea weisen derartige Berichte zurück, sie selbst sprechen nur von gemeinsamen Truppenübungen. In den westlichen Medien wird hingegen die angebliche Kriegsteilnahme Nordkoreas dafür benutzt, um dafür zu werben, NATO-Truppen in der Ukraine zu stationieren. Wie ist deine Ansicht dazu? Nehmen nordkoreanische Soldaten aktiv an Kampfhandlungen gegen die Ukraine teil? Braucht Russland Verstärkung aus Nordkorea, wie die Ukraine behauptet? Well, first of all, no evidence has been provided to back up the Western assertions. Uh, and I don't, I don't even believe that the, the West has said that the North Korean troops are fighting. They, I believe the best we can get out of them is that North Korean troops are on their way to Kursk. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's no evidence of them having arrived at Kursk, let alone being thrown into battle uh, there. Um, as the Russians and North Koreans have said, um, the nature of their strategic relationship allows for each nation to come to the support of others in times of war and conflict. And so from a legal standpoint, um, as far as the Russians and North Koreans are concerned, uh, if North Korean troops were to be on their way to the front lines, um, that's their business, nobody else's business, and there's nothing illegal about it. And the Russians have also said that it's absurd for uh, the West to make any complaints uh, given the scope and scale of their own involvement in the Ukrainian conflict. Um, that being said, I continue to um, doubt the accuracy of this uh, of this claim. Um, it, it's just very complicated to take a um, a foreign army that hasn't trained with you extensively where you have dissimilar operational procedures, not a common language, um, and, and, and then to fight alongside them against a capable enemy uh, in Ukraine, regardless of what you think of their politics, their military is a very capable military, um, where you know, who are possess the capability to di identify um, fractures in uh, an operational scene um, mainly wherever Russian and North Korean troops have come together, that is a place of vulnerability because they don't know how to effectively link forces and provide for overlapping defense. So it becomes a scene that can be exploited. You're literally handing your opponent um, a template for victory. Um, it makes no sense. It really makes no sense. Um, the other thing too is The absurdity of North Koreans fighting on Russian soil to defend Russia, um, that's the job of the Russian army. Uh, um, I don't believe the Russian people want North Korean soldiers on their soil um, liberating their towns and villages. So this politically, this makes no sense either. Um, so I continue to, to doubt very much the notion that North Korea has dispatched a significant number of combat troops uh, Uh, for the purpose of fighting alongside the Russians at Kursk or anywhere else in this war. I do believe that North Korea uh, has promised and will deliver on the promise of um, providing thousands of military uh, engineers that will be used for construction purposes to rebuild uh, destroyed villages and towns and to repair critical infrastructure in territories that Russia is uh, capturing from Ukraine in the Donbass operation and elsewhere. Um, this is something that I could see the North Koreans doing, but I, again, we'll find out in the end, but uh, for me personally, nothing about a major North Korean combat troop deployment to Russia makes any sense.
Liebe Zuschauer, wenn euch unsere Beiträge gefallen, teilt sie unbedingt in den sozialen Medien. Abonniert unseren Kanal und drückt auf die Glocke, damit ihr keine Veröffentlichung von Gegenpol verpasst.